folks, Daniel here with a highly requested how-to video for the V-Sport. Today we're installing the ZZP intake. Up next. The ZZP intake has been a popular modification ever since it came out a few months ago, and I'm kind of glad it did because people have been bugging me to make copies of my custom intake for quite a while now, and honestly, it's a lot of work and I wasn't really up for it. So now, with ZZP's intake, everyone can have an intake on their V-Sport. Now, why do you want to do an intake anyway on your car? Well, generally, we put in aftermarket intakes to improve on the stock one. Uh, the aftermarket intakes often have better air filtration systems, like something that ingests more air more efficiently. Also, smoother tubing to the engine. All this is increase in efficiency, which leads to the potential for more horsepower. Now, most intakes will give you a 5 to 15 horsepower and sometimes more with a tune, but the V-Sport's a little different. On a stock V-Sport, uh, the ECU sets power goals. Horsepower and torque is set to 420 horsepower, 430 foot-pounds. And if it sees the potential for more power being made because you made a change, it's gonna go, no, no, that's not gonna happen. And it's going to limit the horsepower by closing the throttle, adjusting the boost, or the timing so it just hits 420 horsepower. If you get a tune, from what I can tell, it just sort of raises this bar. Uh, we haven't really seen any significant improvements of horsepower using an intake. I've been running one for almost three years and still my best quarter mile time is on a stock airbox with a trifecta tune. ZZP doesn't make any claims on horsepower improvements and trifecta hasn't really chimed in either on combinations of their tune and this intake. So why would you want to install an intake that doesn't make extra horsepower? Well, honestly, it looks pretty darn good in the engine bay. I really like how it looks. It seems to be made well. Also, the driving experience. You definitely hear the car's intake better. You hear the as you apply the throttle, you hear the sound of your blow-off valves, even though you don't have aftermarket blow-off valves. And everyone likes that extra sound. It really does change the experience of driving the car. Now there are other how-tos on installing this intake. ZZP has their own video installing the intake on an ATSV, which is very similar. Also, be sure to check out my buddy Paul's YouTube channel, Previews and Vlogs, where he does a quick review of the installation as well as his review of the product. Link right there and uh, also in the comments section. Now, we're not gonna be installing this on my car. I've already got an intake. So we're gonna install it on another owner's car. This V-Sport belongs to Adrian. He contacted me on Instagram and he said, hey, I'm local, I bought a ZZP intake and I wanna install it, you wanna make a how-to video? And of course, I couldn't refuse. So I'm really thankful for the opportunity to have his car over here now and we can install the intake and give you this how-to video. So, what do you say, let's get to it. ZZP has been in business for nearly 20 years and started out with success in the 3800 W body cars such as the Pontiac Grand Prix. Many of those parts I've actually used myself. The V-Sport intake is solid, it looks clean and durable, and at $499, I think the price is very reasonable for a dual intake setup. They chose to use mass airflow tubes of approximately 68 millimeters, which is about the average of the two stock MAF tubes, which are 71 and 66 millimeters each. This difference in diameter from stock is why tuning is suggested to have optimum performance, but according to ZZP, it's not required. However, the one thing I'm not a fan of with this airbox is that it's not sealed off from the engine bay, which could result in higher than stock intake temperatures. All right, now let's get on to a 45 second overview of how the install goes. First, remove the center crossover from your stock intake and then the stock airbox. Then we'll pull out the driver's side air outlet tube and associated connections. Then loosen the coolant reservoir and remove the passenger side air outlet tube. We'll need to swap this pressure sensor over to the new air outlet tube from ZZP and then install that tube into the car. After that, you can put your coolant reservoir back into place, then install the driver side air outlet tube and associated connections, assemble the filters, crossover, and air box, swap over the mass airflow sensors from the stock air box to the new air intake setup, and then install the rest of the intake. After everything's secure, put the engine cover back on and start it up. And heads up, if you notice anything out of place in the video, it's because I've reordered things as necessary. Hindsight is 2020, and we don't always do things right the first time, but I've set them in the video as logically and convenient as possible. For this installation, you'll need the following tools. I always recommend a flashlight to see in the dark spaces of the engine bay, a long flathead screwdriver like this, a smaller or medium sized flathead screwdriver, hose clamp pliers, and if you don't have these, you might have some luck with some large needle nose 
or a wide grip uh, pliers. You'll want some extensions like this 9 inch and a 6 inch and a swivel or universal joint. 10 millimeter deep socket, 11 millimeter deep socket, 3 8 inch ratchet. I like to have uh, this socket driver and I use it with my T30 Torx, T25 Torx, and T20 Torx will be required. You'll need a pick with a 90 degree tip on it. Trim removal tool like this or in a jam you could probably just use a flathead screwdriver or needle nose pliers. You'll also need Allen keys like this, 5 millimeter and 2 millimeter. It doesn't really matter what type. Also, you'll need rubber end caps like shown here. This is to seal off the coolant reservoir bottle while you work on it. You also need maybe some gloves to keep your hands clean. And while the engine bay is opened up and you have the intake out, you may want to clean up in there. So cleaning supplies as necessary. All right, now let's get to the installation. First, let's remove the engine cover. Use a T30 Torx bit to remove the screw on the left side of the engine cover and then Remove your oil cap, lift the cover, and pull it straight towards you. Put your oil cap back on. Next, we need to get rid of this crossover. First, loosen the clamp that's closest to the coolant reservoir. Just loosen it, you don't need to remove it. Then, loosen this clamp closest to the air box. Next, loosen the clamp to the elbow on the driver's side connected to the air box. Now you'll be able to pull the crossover away and free from the air box and the air outlet tube on the passenger side. You can also pull the elbow away from the stock air box. Now you'll want to lift the crossover away from the engine, but it is kind of held in by these studs, so it may require a slight pull. Also underneath the crossover is this vacuum tube that needs to be disconnected. Just press on the gray area with your thumb and pull it off. And next we'll disconnect the mass airflow sensor connectors. These are released by sliding the clip on the back up. There's a gray one and then a red one on the driver's side. And then press the little button on the back side of the clip. Next you'll use a pry tool to uh, pop up this cable mount on the air box. Then you can lift the air box out of its spot. It's held in by three little prongs, so you just kind of give it some force to pull it straight up. And then you can lift the rear section and it's easiest to get it out that way. As you get it up, you're gonna see that the MAF sensors are still connected with another cable mount. Go ahead and pry that off. Once you've got that done, You've got an empty engine bay and a little room to work. Now we're gonna remove the driver air outlet tube. We have to release these clips. You can see them here. This is them released, clipped in, released, clipped in. Now we're going to use a long screwdriver and just try to pry those away while you sort of pull up on the air outlet tube. It's annoying because one will clip right back in while the other one comes out and vice versa, but eventually you'll get it. Now you'll see here, I've got the clip mostly out, but it's not quite moving. You'll need to release the clip completely and you'll probably need to pry up here on this section. This will release the air outlet tube from the mount. Once that releases it, you'll have a better time of getting it up and away from the turbo. Just keep working on it, it'll come out. This took no more than five minutes. Eventually you'll have it out and you can lift it up and away. And now you have access to disconnect a couple more things. Now this tube connector is giving people a lot of trouble. CZP recommends using a modified fuel line tool, but a 90 degree pick seems to work pretty well. I just pull up gently on the tube and just poke the pick right up in there at various spots. And it came off within about 15 seconds. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Next, you need to remove the driver's side air recirculation tube. Adrian's car has aftermarket blow-off valves, so we just release the clamp and pull the tube off. And it's very similar on the stock car, but there are some details I want to show you. Here it is on the passenger side. First, loosen the hose clamp with some hose clamp pliers and push it out of the way. Then, the hose is pretty well sort of mated to the plastic over time, so you'll need to gently work it away with a flathead screwdriver or a pick until the seal sort of breaks. And then, 
you can slide it back. But be careful, the stock valves are plastic and become brittle. Now that all the connections are free, you can pull the assembly out. Next, we're going to dislocate the coolant reservoir bottle. Just uh, grab the clamp on the hose and pull it back, and then you'll release the hose. But you need to be ready for spills. If your coolant reservoir is full like it's supposed to be, you're gonna have coolant coming out. That's when you'll wanna use the rubber cap to cap it off. I capped off the hose, but if your coolant reservoir is full, you need to cap off the reservoir itself. Also clean up any spilled coolant immediately for pet safety. Next, remove the coolant reservoir with a 10 millimeter deep socket. Just lift it straight up and then just tilt it back when you need to work on it like this. Now it's time to release this pressure sensor connector. At first we thought his was broken, but later I realized that this is not how the clip goes. So here's how I did it on my car. I just used a screwdriver and gently pushed the clip to the left. Unfortunately, I broke that too. So then I tried poking in here. You should probably use a pick though instead and then you can get the clip over to the left and then you can use your thumb to press on the spring button and slide the connector off. Next, you'll want to release this line. Just use this little plastic piece, push it out of the way, and pull the line back. To gain access to the hose clamp for the recirculation tube on this side, it may be helpful to remove this line. Just press on it with your thumb like you did the crossover valve. Now it's easier to get to the hose clamp. Next, remove the passenger side recirculation hose like I showed you earlier. The passenger side is not like the driver's side. In this case, you'll use a T30 Torx bit to remove a screw on the mount. Next is a little bit of a challenge. You need to push that coolant bottle out of the way and use a very long flathead screwdriver to push away the clips on the turbo inlet. Just like we did on the driver's side, it'll take you a few minutes to work those clips away and have them both release. It definitely helps to have a helping hand. With some patience, you'll have it released and you can pull the entire assembly out. Now we need to move the pressure sensor from the stock air outlet tube over to the new ZZP part. Use your T25 Torx to release this screw. Then the pressure sensor just pulls straight out. Transfer it over to the ZZP part. Since the ZZP part uses new hardware, you'll need to use a 5mm Allen key to put this screw in. That silver mount it's on, you can actually twist that so that the connector is facing back towards the firewall just like it was on the stock part. Then tighten down the clamp. Next we're going to slide the whole assembly back down onto the turbo. Your clamp should be pre-positioned from the ZZP factory, but if not, you need to make sure that the clamp bolt is pointed back towards the passenger seat. Once you think it's set down and fully seated, you can get down there and tighten the clamp. You can see it way down there. Use your phone if you need to to slide it to the back side and take a look at the clamp and make sure it looks right and to make sure that the assembly is fully seated on the turbo inlet. Next, put together your ratchet and extensions like this. A long, a flex, and then a shorter extension along with a deep 11 millimeter socket. You'll need somebody to hold the assembly so that it sits fully seated on the turbo inlet. We had to do it a couple times because we weren't quite sure if it was seated properly. But even after the clamp is fully tightened, it's still gonna wiggle a little bit just because of the flexibility of the tube assembly. And now you can reattach all the accessory lines to the assembly. First, I'll attach Adrian's blow-off valve hoses here, but if you have a stock setup, you'll reconnect your recirculation hoses. Then reconnect this small line, it just clicks into place. And then put the pressure sensor connector back on. It also clicks into place. Now you wanna remount the coolant bottle. There's a grommet here that goes over a stud on the strut tower. You'll wanna get that lined up as well as the upper stud on the strut tower. Then you can tighten down the nut on the upper stud with a 10 millimeter socket. Now reconnect the coolant reservoir overflow hose. 
Just push it back on the nipple and just squeeze the clamp and slide it back into place. Be sure to clean up any spilled coolant right away. Now it's time to install the driver side assembly. It's much easier than the passenger side. Get it fully seated, but don't fully tighten the clamp yet. We'll need to make some adjustments. The airbox goes in this area here, and there are three grommets where the airbox pins sort of lock it into place. If you don't see your grommets, they may still be on the airbox and they should be removed back to the engine bay. Now take the ZZP airbox lid and position it into the grommets. We're only doing this temporarily so that we can adjust the air outlet tube so that it aligns with the hole here. Once you have it twisted in the appropriate position, then you can tighten down the clamp at the turbo inlet. The clamp nut should be positioned so that you can get at it just like this. It should be fairly easy. Here we're just using a small extension and 11 millimeter socket. And there's actually a lot of clamping to do here, so this may take a while. I've sped this up eight times. Once that clamp is secure, now it's time to connect all the other accessories on the driver's side. First we'll connect Adrian's blow-off valves, in your case of course the recirculation tubes on a stock setup. Then you'll want to connect this line, it just clicks into place, just like that. And then make sure it's not like rubbing against these AC lines here, reposition it so that it's free and away from this area for vibration. Remember, the engine rocks left to right when you drive it. All right, now it's time to assemble the airbox and filters. You want to put this mass airflow tube with the silver side facing towards the inside of the box. Then attach one of the filters and tighten the clamp to hold the assembly in place. Remember, this doesn't have to be super tight. There's no pressurization going on here, but you just want it snug. Next, take the crossover and position it into the hole and put a filter on the other side and tighten up the clamp. And I should probably mention, try not to get fingerprints on the inside of the polycarbonate box because it's really hard to clean once the filters are in. Next, you're gonna wanna move the mass airflow sensors from the stock box over to the new intake. These come off with a T20 Torx bit and then handle the sensors carefully. They are sensitive instruments. Take note of which sensor was where. The driver's side one has sort of an L shape to it. Once you get them out, put the screws back into the stock airbox so you don't lose them. For the next step, I recommend installing the MAF sensors to the new intake while it's out of the car. We didn't do that in fear of damaging the sensors as we installed the intake, but now I realize it would have been much easier. Put the sensor into the slot with the hole facing towards the air filter. This hole is what's capturing the airflow and measuring how much airflow there is. Use the ZZP supplied screws. They use a 2.5 millimeter Allen key. Be really careful when handling screws in this area if you're doing it in the engine bay. You don't want to drop one of these. That's another good reason to do this while it's out of the car. Once the driver's side is done, go ahead and do the passenger side or the crossover MAF sensor. It was quite a reach when it was in the engine bay, so again, do this outside of the car. Once you've swapped over the MAF sensors, it's time to put the crossover airbox and filter assembly into the engine bay. Get it aligned with the passenger side tube, and then get that filter cover aligned and into those three grommets that we talked about earlier. It'll take a little fiddling to get everything lined up properly. You may need to twist the crossover a little bit and so that the two studs can fit into the engine mount. It didn't quite seat for us and I think other people reported the same. And now it's time to reconnect the MAF sensor wires. Click the connector in place and then on the driver's side there's a red lock so slide that down. And on the passenger side after you click it into place there's a gray lock that needs to be slid into place. Then tighten up your hose clamps, both on the driver's side and on the passenger side. 
Remember there was a vacuum tube at the crossover, so use the ZZP supplied extension, connect it to the passenger side air outlet tube assembly, and then run the extension down underneath the crossover and connect it with the stock vacuum tube. Make sure that it's not hitting the radiator fan. You may pull up the slack over here where my left hand is and just to keep it out of the way from hitting things. All right, the intake is installed. Now just double check your connections and clamps and we'll start the engine. Once the engine started, listen for problems like squeals or whistles that would indicate that you don't have a hose completely tightened down. Also, if the car is stumbling and not running properly, it's probably because you missed a MAF sensor connector or you have a MAF sensor turned the wrong way or in the wrong position. On first start, your radiator fans will run full blast, but on second start, they'll be back to normal again. If everything's running right, put your engine cover back on. Remember to use the T30 Torx bit on the screw and then tighten down your oil cap again. When you go for a drive, don't forget to bring some tools with you just in case you need to re-tighten something on the way. All right, congrats, you've installed the ZZP intake. Wasn't too bad, right? Now let's take it for a spin and enjoy the sweet sounds of intake noise and Adrian's Corsa exhaust. Now, although Adrian has blow-off valves, they're really not too much louder than how the intake sounds. All right, that's it for the install on the ZZP intake. I hope this how-to was helpful and had the details you needed to get the job done on your own without any hiccups. Now I thought it would be a little harder in some areas, but thanks to a lot of feedback and the Facebook groups, I can see where people had challenges and thanks to them overcoming their challenges, it was easier for me to knock it out. For example, don't worry about using a modified fuel line tool on those one connectors, just use a pick. I got it done in 15 seconds on my first try. The other hard part was near the uh, coolant reservoir, but if you just loosen the coolant reservoir, you don't have to take it out completely. You should be able to get in there. It does help to have a second set of hands though, of course. Now, of course, doing filming on a how-to, it takes a lot longer to get things done, but I can feel pretty confident that if you're good with your tools, you should be able to knock out this install in less than a couple hours. Unfortunately, this is challenging for people that want to swap out their stock intake for visits to the dealership because having this intake in there could be a red flag for some dealers and they may want to void your warranty right away. So I don't recommend going to the dealer with your intake installed, but you're looking at, at you know a two hour job each time you go to visit the dealer. And don't forget to take your trifecta tune out if you've got one in there as well. All right, that's it for this how-to. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you'll be notified when the next Jet Fuel Only video comes out. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.